Hey, by then build, it's Walker Dival. I want to um, cover the different terms for different kinds of earnings today. Um, it came up in the Facebook group that you know someone was um, inter using EBITDA and uh, SDE as interchangeable, and uh, they're they're very different. And so I want to kind of unpack the different terms for uh, different earnings amounts and when each one is sort of used uh, at, at different times. And so actually, um, the, you know, the, the first one, just at the highest level, I wanna cover like on, on a income statement, on a, on a profit and loss statement, you've got at the top line revenue, and then you have cost of goods sold, then you have gross margin, which is the, 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 obviously the margin after the cost of the materials to make the item, and sometimes the, the um, uh, direct labor associated. And then you have operating expenses, and that's where most of your overhead, most of your advertising, um, things like that are, gonna, are going to exist, okay? Then you, you, you ultimately get the bottom line after all the expenses, which is net income, okay? <clears throat> now, there is a couple of <clears throat> non-cash expenses, okay? And that, that, what that means is, is that, you know, if I buy a big piece of infrastructure in year one, okay, um, you know, I, I can't expense all of this on my PL so that I don't pay, so that I have a, a loss. What I do is, is I take the, the, the cost of this and I spread it out over a number of years, depending on what the thing is. And so this is called depreciation or amortization, depending on if it's a hard asset or a, or a um, uh, um, intangible asset. Okay, so you build a new website. Uh, it's a really awesome website and it's, you know, $100,000, okay? And so um, rather than taking all of that as an operating expense in one year, uh, I'm going to amortize it over 10 years. And so there's a, a $10,000 expense every year on my, on my um, uh, P&L income statement. The thing is, is that in each one of these years, I'm not actually paying $10,000, am I? It's, it's, it's an illusion of some money that was spent back here that's being captured in future years, okay? So in that, in that depreciation and amortization model, um, what's, what's happening is this is called a non-cash expense. Now, John Malone, and I don't know the exact year, but I think it was like in the early 80s, okay, uh, came up with a concept of EBITDA, okay? And uh, the reason for this was that, you know, he was using acquisitions to drive, um, <clears throat> number one, to drive the, the growth of his company. Number two, he was using it to increase um, um, the amount of expenses that the company, non-cash expenses that the company had, because you get to depreciate uh, the entire cost of a business, by the way. But so the thing is, is he was depreciating the additional acquisitions, which was increasing the amount of cash flow. But the, but the public markets at that time only understood earnings per share. That's how they to told time. Like what's the net income versus like the, the, the amount of shares that were out there. And he came up with the term EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, okay? And so that is the term that is used in the publicly traded markets to sort of um, try to compare one company to another in an apples to apples situation, okay? So, you know, two different cable companies like John Malone's TCI, one of them has an EBITDA of, you know, $100, and the other one has an EBITDA of $150. Which one's better, right? You know, the 150. But you can't exactly see that in like an earnings per share or a net income, especially if you're buried, if your net income is buried in all these non-cash expenses. So that's that's a good way to tell time in a publicly traded uh, company, okay? Larger publicly traded company. So when it comes to the middle market, which is going to be like, you know, there's various... Uh, definitions of, of <clears throat> when the lower middle market starts, okay? Um, some, I've heard as low as like 2 million or 3 million. Uh, some people say it's 5 million and up, whatever. But you know, the, the solid middle market, okay? So that's gonna be say 25 million uh, to $250 million transactions, okay? Um, they've come up with a term called adjusted EBITDA, okay? I'm sorry. Sorry for the angle, the, uh, the light was, was glaring off the whiteboard here, which you can see. So adjusted EBITDA. And so, so the question is, what are you adjusting? Well, adjusted EBITDA takes into consideration a number of ad backs and one-time expenses to try to illustrate the normal EBITDA for a new owner, okay? So for example, let's pretend that there was, you know, 
um, <clears throat> sensitive and therefore probably bad example. But you know, let's just say that there was a, a, a you know a one hundred thousand um, dollar legal battle. Okay, that is settled and done, and that expense will not occur again. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to add back uh, those sort of professional. Uh, services for $100,000 because it's it was sort of a, a discretionary spend due to what was going on. Let's say that there was a big um, uh, capital expenditure that took place um, that was a one-time event that will not need to be uh, redone in the future. That capital expenditure might go back in there, okay? Now, ad backs are important for all, you know, all of the adjusted EBITDA and what we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, but the, but the point with adjusted EBITDA is it really reflects the earnings of a company to an owner after it's being managed after there's already you know a president ceo management team in place okay so it's sort of like in a way an absentee owner or a strategic um, acquirer or in fact you okay if, if you can buy a 50 million dollar company um and and you don't actually have to operate it okay and so adjusted ebitda i start to see um it's definitely heavily considered in deals over um, um, 10 million in transaction value, okay? Um, I've seen it um, lower. The, I, I, I tend to really pay attention to it once I, once I get over a $5 million deal, okay? Anything that's sort of like Main Street, like sub, sub sort of, um, you know, $5 million say. Um, I start to, you know, the, the market tends to use seller discretionary earnings or SDE. And the whole concept behind seller's discretionary earnings is how much money is available in this black box of a company um, that is generating cash flow to its owner, right? So this is the amount of money that you can take out as salary, that you can reinvest into the business, that you can use to pay down principal and interest payments. Um, and so seller discretionary earnings, or sometimes called DE or discretionary earnings, is the total amount of money available to an owner. And sometimes you can use that to even hire a manager, which would make it an adjusted EBITDA number, okay? But you know, EBITDA is kind of that financial metric used at publicly traded company level. Adjusted EBITDA is more in the uh, private middle markets and seller discretionary earnings is really the total cash flow um, available to an owner for all of these kind of management decisions, either to, to operate yourself or um, turn it into an adjusted EBITDA number uh, by hiring a manager. So th those are the, the three biggest um, areas of earnings and how people sort of tell time in acquisitions, usually depending on size. Um, and so as you can see, they're a little bit different. And you'll also start to see, if you really start to get used to the market, you'll start to see that each one of these has sort of different common multiples and valuations associated with them. Um, and so uh, it continues to, to grow from here. But th these are the three different uh, methods of earnings. And I hope that gives you some clarity and insight into the different units of measure, all trying to tackle the same thing, which is what is the cash flow that this entity is kind of generating, right? Um, if you are thinking about buying a business this year, uh, feel free to check out the Acquisition Lab at acquisitionlab.com. Um, and apply to an exclusive group of people that we're working with to um, educate and help around uh, um, acquisition entrepreneurship or, uh, of course, um, pick up a copy of uh, Buy Then Build, which is uh, my book on the subject. Thanks so much.